In the previous video, I introduced the multi-store model of memory. And in that video, I said the long-term memory store is coded semantically. We store information according to what it means. But when I think of a bike, I do know semantically what it means to say bike, the definition of the word, but I also remember how to ride a bike. It's a muscle memory, and it seems like a different type of long-term memory from a semantic memory. I can also think back and remember what happened the last time I rode a bike. Again, that seems to be a very different type of long-term memory. So let's explore three types of long-term memory, semantic, procedural, and episodic in this PsychBoost video. You can now follow along by making your notes in my PsychBoost workbook, 150 full color worksheets covering all the compulsory units. It's on Amazon, or you can get signed editions from my website. And teachers can order packs for the whole class. Semantic, procedural, and episodic long-term memory. These are the three types of long-term memory. What I want to do is show you how we can define them as distinct processes and look at some research and evaluations that support or contradict that they are actually separate. The first distinction I want to make is between the different types of long-term memory. And that is if we can put the memory into words. So if the type of long-term memory is declarative or not. Now with two types, episodic and semantic, we would say they're declarative. So going back to my example, if you ask me, do you know what a bike is? I would say, yeah, it's a two wheeled vehicle that you sit on and you move by turning the pedals. That's a semantic memory and I've described it in words. If you ask me when was the last time I rode a bike, I would say I hired a bike last summer and I rode it in the Peak District. It was beautiful, but it was the hottest day of the year, so a little intense. You can see there's a range of episodic points about the last time I rode a bike. An episode from my life that I've been able to put into words. But if you ask me to describe in words how to ride a bike, I get a little stuck. I mean, obviously you sit on it, you hold the handles and you pedal, but that's not it. Anyone trying for the first time with just those instructions is going to fall off. Because riding a bike is like other procedural memories. It's a non-declarative implicit skill. We would call it a procedural memory, also known as muscle memory. I can do it easily, but I do it unconsciously after I've learned the skill. Let's take another example. Someone who knows how to play guitar will have semantic memories of what a guitar is, episodic memories of playing a guitar for others, and procedural memories of how to actually play guitar. And applications are common in this section. You may want to take a moment to think of other long-term memories that you can separate and classify as episodic, semantic, and procedural. So from those examples, we can see we've got two categories, declarative and non-declarative. Given a quick definition for the two declarative memories, episodic memories are our memories for particular events in our lives, and semantic memory is our knowledge about the world, so facts and concepts. And to define non-declarative procedural memory, it's an unconscious memory of skills known as muscle memory. But there are lots of differences between these types of long-term memory that we should know, and will help us define them as separate processes. Now you don't need to remember absolutely all of these, but what you can do is pick a few to use, so if you're asked to talk about the differences between them. Firstly, I've already talked about declarative versus non-declarative, but next, time-stamped. This means, is the memory stored with a reference to time and place? Well, with episodic, yes. If I think back, I've got a sense of when that memory happened. If I think back to when I was in school, when I started teaching, or I think of something that happened yesterday, each of those memories are associated with a particular time in my life. When it comes to semantic memories, well, not really. I know a range of facts, but for the vast majority of them, I do not remember when I learned that fact. I've got a strong semantic memory that Paris is the capital of France, but I've got no idea when I learned that fact. And procedural memories are also not timestamped. I don't remember when the first time I learned to tie my shoes, but it is a strong procedural memory. Both episodic memories and semantic memories can be recalled consciously. I have a sense of if I want to try to remember something that happened to me or a fact, I think and I try to bring the information into consciousness. But procedural memories, I can just perform it unconsciously. Episodic memories are autobiographical. They're about me and my life experiences. And when I think about them, I'm part of the memory. 
but neither semantic or procedural memories are autobiographical. Episodic memories are easy to forget. Semantic memories are more resistant to forgetting, and procedural memories are very resistant to forgetting. I mean, we even have the phrase, it's like riding a bike, to describe how you can perform a skill well after many years when you haven't done it. The level of emotion felt when coded influences the strength of episodic memories. How deeply information is processed affects the strength of semantic memories, so how many other bits of information we can link to it. And when it comes to procedural, how much practice we've had with that skill will affect its strength. Finally, when it comes to brain regions, with episodic, the first coding seems to be in the prefrontal cortex, but it's stored across the brain connected by the hippocampus. With semantic memory, one of the associated brain regions is the parahippocampal cortice. And for procedural memories, there's a role for the motor cortex and the cerebellum. Evaluating types of long-term memory. To evaluate, we want to look at evidence that suggests that these three types of long-term memory are truly separate, if we can trust that research, but also are there any reasons to think they're not actually distinct? Firstly, we have research by Vagara Kadim. This was an investigation of three young amnesic patients who had all suffered damage to their hippocampus, but a nearby region called the parahippocampal cortices were reasonably undamaged. It was found that all of these children had significant episodic amnesia, but they were all able to attend school because their semantic ability was largely unaffected. They learned to speak and could recall factual information at a level just a little below what was normal for their age. These results suggest that episodic and semantic memories are separate processes that function using separate brain regions. One of the most famous case studies in psychology is that of Clive Waring. After severe brain damage to his hippocampus caused by a virus, he has retrograde amnesia, meaning he can't remember episodic memories from before the brain damage, like his wedding day. But he can recall semantic memories, like the fact that he's married to his wife Deborah. And he still has the ability to play the piano, which is, of course, a procedural memory. He also has anterior grade amnesia, so he can't make new episodic or semantic memories. Very interestingly, under experimental conditions though, Clive and other amnesiac patients like HM, when trained on a procedural skill, can improve on that procedural skill, but they won't retain any episodic or semantic memory of actually doing the skill. These case studies show that the three types of long-term memory are separate processes, as each process can remain while the others are completely lost. Now much of the research on types of long-term memory use clinical case studies. This is an example of ideographic research. These studies allow an in-depth investigation of memory in a way that would be simply impossible in an experimental setup. However, because they're individuals, and unusual individuals at that, we may not be able to generalize findings on the types of long-term memory to other, healthy people. It may be that their brain damage is more extensive than we can see, so there may be other reasons for their unusual experiences. However, researchers like Tolving use modern cognitive neuroscience studies using PET and fMRI scanners to investigate how different types of long-term memories are linked to areas of brain activation. These nomothetic methods using healthy samples also show distinctions between the types of long-term memory, backing up observations from case studies. This increases our confidence that types of long-term memory truly are separate. However, there are reasons to argue that there may not be such a clear-cut separation between the different types of long-term memory. Firstly, episodic and semantic memories are both declarative. Also, episodic memories tend to become semantic memories over time. Also, there is a strong connection between procedural and semantic memory, as we're able to produce automatic language. This is the fact that we're able to fluently talk using a wide range of semantic facts and concepts quickly without having to consciously consider and recall every semantic fact. Now, have a go at this real exam question on types of long-term memory. If you're a PsychBoost patron at the neuron level or above, you can access the tutorial on psychboost.com. And in it, I'll talk you through a model answer for this question and general tips. For everyone else, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the videos released right after the exams. And I'll see you in the next Psych Boost video, The Working Memory Model.